Hello everyone, my name is Hani Chen from Summercock Software. Today I'm very glad to present our Kafka databases developed for aluminum alloys and to demonstrate their applications to process optimization in the aluminum industry. Our aluminum alloy databases consist of a thermodynamic database, TCL7, and an atomic mobility database, Mobile AL6. TCL7 is more than a conventional thermodynamic database. Except for descriptions of Gibbs energy, it also contains viscosity and the surface tension of liquid, molar volume, electric resistivity, and the semiconductivity of liquid and all solid phases. One can directly use the databases to calculate various properties, stable and metastable phase equilibria and the different types of phase diagrams. Moreover, one can simulate various processes in aluminum industry from solidification to homogenization and to aging treatments, as well as recycling, semi-solid manufacturing, and the additive manufacturing, etc. etc. The TCA Luminous 7 and the Mobile Air 6 databases are developed in a very large framework and they contain 39 elements in TCA Luminous 7, 267 binaries and 99 ternaries are assessed. It contains all the stable phases that form in each of the assessed systems. And the most important metastable phases that precipitate in either solidification or aging treatments. Mobile AL6 contains mobility data for the aluminum matrix phases, including FCCA1 and the liquid. Covered calculations rely on not only the databases, but also computational tools. We have some calculation for equilibrium calculation and uh, solidification simulation. Dictionary is to simulate uh, diffusion controlled phase transformations. Prisma can be used for simulating concurrent nucleation, growth, and quartering in multi-particle precipitation. We also have uh, several software developing cases, especially TC Python. It is now feature completed and can do everything that uh, some architecture and uh, Prisma do. It enables one to make uh, customized calculations and uh, high throughput calculations. Today, I will focus on the simulations for the life cycle of aluminum alloys, from solidification to solution treatment and to aging treatment, as well as aluminum Scraps recycling. Most of the aluminum alloys start with casting, so let's start with the solidification simulations. To most of the people, the goal is to predict the phase formation and its formation sequence during the course of solidification. On the left hand side is an example with a 7075 alloy. The dashed line corresponds to an equilibrium calculation and the solid line to a shy simulation. We see the predicted primary phase and the particles that might form as green boundaries. Regarding the castability, we can, for instance, evaluate the cost in shrinkage due to the descriptions of motor volume and uh, some expensivity. As shown here, the silicon addition decreases the shrinkage load volume because the liquid silicon has a higher density than the solid silicon. We can also evaluate the hot chilling susceptibility based on the concept of the terminal freezing range. The 7075 alloy has a quite large terminal freezing range of more than 40 kelvin, and thus is highly susceptible to hot chilling. By comparison, the 3000 series has a small terminal freezing range. It is only about 3 kelvin. However, Adding copper may sharply increase the terminal freezing range and adjust the hot chilling susceptibility, as evidenced with the experiments by others. Except for the simple concept of terminal freezing range, we can also use a more advanced model, which evaluates the so called uh, cracking susceptibility coefficient, as shown here on the right hand side, the plot. 
reproduces the evaluation of many multi-component aluminum alloys in literature. One last lesson that I would like to show about sonification is the prediction of composition segregation in the aluminum grains. As shown on the left hand side, during the non equilibrium sonification, copper atoms would be accumulated in the outer ring of the grains. Increases the copper contents in the alloys would also increase the copper concentration in the cores of the grains and thus reduce the composition difference between the cords and the outer rings, but this would also increase the thickness of the outer rings. This prediction agrees very well with the experimental microstructures as observed in the literature. Due to the segregation and the green boundary particles, we may consider to homogenize the matrix and to dissolve the particles. Very often, the two goals can be achieved at the same time. Here is a stepping calculation for the 1793 alloy. It shows a narrow aluminum single phase region from 462 to 475 Celsius. So an intermediate temperature could be chosen as the heating temperature. This would agree with the experimental temperature 470 Celsius very well. People may wonder, what if the real composition is different from the nominal one? Well, we can perform an uncertainty evaluation within the specification tolerance. The plot on the right hand side is from an evaluation of 200 different compositions in this range. The resulting upper temperature is no longer a fixed value, but varies from 470 to 486 Celsius. Interestingly, we still see a common single phase region. 468 Celsius would be a valid process temperature for all the compositions. Once the temperature is determined, we can further optimize the time with the temperature simulations, the dissolution of green boundary particles depends on the particle size. The homogenization depends on the aluminum grain size. We should first obtain such information from as custom microstructures examination. If there are several particles, we should consider either all of them or focus on the most problematic one. Here on the left hand side, we just to show one plot, but we should make extensive simulations in reality. Sometimes we can optimize both temperature and the time with the aids of simulations. On the right hand side is a simulation of dissolution of silicon particles. As you can see, 500 Celsius is definitely too low because about 20% particles remain after several hours heating. At 530 Celsius, the particles could be fully dissolved within less than one hour. At 560, it needs less than 15 minutes. The final decision would of course depend on the other considerations and one could also refine the temperature a bit with simulations, say, between 530 and 560 Celsius. We then investigated the aging treatment. Here we simulated the precipitation of the eta prime phase in a two-stage aging treatment. The simulation was done with the TCAL8 database, which is to be released soon. The water fraction of the precipitates agrees with the data within the experimental uncertainty. The kink in the curve indicates the partial dissolution when the aging temperature was increased from 120 to 135 Celsius. The solute contents in the precipitates are well accounted for, especially the substitution of zinc atoms by copper atoms. The modeling of the eta prime phase was done in the aluminum copper magnesium zinc quaternary system, which is the basis of the 1793 alloy. So this video here illustrates the homogeneity ranges of the eta prime phase, T prime, S prime, and the S double prime 
as well as the equilibrium T phase and the eta phases. Aluminum alloys have very good recyclability, and the recycling is of great interest since it consumes only about 5% energy compared to the production of primary aluminum alloys. This is a general procedure of scrap recycling, and we can make a difference to the smelting and the costing. We have already dealt with costing earlier in this talk, and we only demonstrated the applications in the smelting here. Let's focus on the ion impurity. It may form detrimental phases such as the beta aluminum ion silicon. There are several solutions to this issue, either to form ion aluminize and remove them with physical means, or we can add manganese to form manganese containing aluminum 15 particles. We can also consider removing those particles as well. For a specific scrap composition, we can optimize the heating temperature and the manganese addition. Obviously, the options are limited in the two phase regions of liquid plus aluminum 15. In literature, some people experimentally investigated very high temperatures, which are close to the liquids. This definitely should be avoided. To remove as much iron as possible, the options must be away from the liquids. We should increase the manganese addition and lower the temperature, but should not be below this blue line, because under it, aluminum grains would also precipitate. When you remove aluminum 15, you would also remove aluminum grains. This would reduce the yield of the purified aluminum melt. If you find it difficult to understand the plots, which were just shown, you may also define your function and directly plot the ion removal fraction as illustrated on the left-hand side. Once the temperature is defined, we can further work on the manganese addition, but that depends on the target alloy composition. As you see here, adding manganese would always decrease the ion content in the melt, but the benefit is less effective at higher manganese contents than lower manganese contents. Also, a higher manganese addition would result in a higher manganese content in the melt and also a higher cost. Finally, I would like to show you the recent progresses in the modeling of some physical properties. I do not have the time to talk about the theories and the models. Instead, I will briefly show you how the results look like with the simple examples. For viscosity, we modeled the dynamic viscosity, but a converted term is described in the database because this benefits the extrapolation. For calculations, the software would convert values back to dynamic viscosity. Kinematic viscosity is dynamic viscosity divided by density. The density can be easily calculated from the molar volume data, which are available in our database. Here I show viscosity of aluminum copper and uh, aluminum copper silicon melts. It should be noted that experiment uncertainties are usually large and they can be up to one order of magnitude to viscosity. Surface tension is a model based on the modified Guggenheim model. Sigma is for each pure element, chi is the so-called dumping factor, and uh, it is used to describe the composition dependence as shown with this equation. We don't have to worry about the details, since the difficulties and the complexities are taken care of by the software. Self is the surface energy that we calculate with the database. Here are examples of silver, copper, aluminum, copper, and uh, aluminum, silver, copper melts. Simply speaking, the modeling of electrical resistivity is based on the multi-sense rule summing up the contributions from different scatterings 
to give the total resistivity. The core is the evaluation of electron phonon contributions based on the Bloch relation equation. The magnetic model was established in our work. There would be corrections for other types of scatterings, and we will skip the details here. The plot on the top shows the electrical resistivity of pure nickel, which has a significant contribution from magnetic disordering. The extrapolation from Euler rays to higher order systems relies on the readiness case expression. The plot on the bottom is the calculation for the aluminum magnesium binary solid solution. The modeling of thermoconductivity is done together with that of electrical resistivity. Since they are related in the sense that uh, electronic thermoconductivity can be derived from electrical resistivity with the Wiedemann front law, the lattice thermoconductivity may be approximated with the Calvary model or even the Slack model. Here, the plots are for pure aluminum and uh, pure copper. The extrapolation to higher order systems also relies on the readiness case study expression, but it applies to the resistivity instead of the conductivity. This is how the semiconductivity of a binary solid solution look like. Here are shown the electrical resistivity and the semiconductivity of multi-component aluminum alloys. Most of the data can be accounted for within an uncertainty of 20% and many within 10%. Such uncertainties are very common in the experiment data for transport properties. It has to be added that the properties rely on the physical distribution and the measuring temperature. An alloy might be solution treated at a very high temperature and then quenched to room temperature and uh, made there. We should use the so-called freezing in technique to calculate such properties. Basically, we calculate the phase equilibria at the solution treating temperature and then change the temperature to the main temperature. And then directly retrieve the results without recomputing the phase equilibria. To summarize, we presented you a package of covered databases, TC Aluminum 7 and Mobile AR6. In addition to Gibbs Energy and Atomic Mobility, the databases also contain viscosity and the surface tension of liquid, and the molecular electrical resistivity and the thermal conductivity of liquid and all solid phases. I have demonstrated that there are applications in the life cycle of aluminum alloys, from casting to solution treating to aging treatment, as well as uh, recycling. I do not have the chance to talk about semi-solid forming and the additive manufacturing. I hope I could do that in the near future on some other events. Thank you for your attention.